Today, we wrap up our sermon series in 1 John with a careful look at the fifth and final chapter. And one of John's favorite phrases in 1 John is, I write to you. This is what he says, I write to you. It's in 1 John chapter 2. I'm writing these things so that I write these things to you. He wants you to know why he wrote this letter. And he wants you to know the point of this letter. So when we combine all of the I write to you together, we get a clear understanding of why he wrote the letter. Take a look. I am writing because you are true believers. This is a summary. But there are deceivers in your midst. And I want you to be rock-solid confident in your present possession of eternal life as children born of God, so that you are not drawn away after sin. And if this letter has that effect, my joy will be complete. That's why John wrote 1 John. I want you, though, to look carefully at the words in yellow, born of God. This is a major theme in 1 John. It appears several times, four times in chapter 5, and seven times total in this book. So it's a significant teaching, and we as Christians need to know what it means. So today, if we understand born of God, we'll understand the fifth chapter, and we'll understand more clearly 1 John. We're going to answer the question, what is it? What is being born of God? And the second question we're going to answer is, are you personally born of God? And the third one is, what difference does this make in my life? So those are the three questions we're going to cover as we go along. I invite you to take notes on the back of your bulletin as we go forward, and you can apply these teachings to your life throughout the week and going forward from there. When we talk about being born again, it's really important to start off that you know that born of God... Born again and new birth are synonymous. They mean the same thing in Scripture. You'll have different authors in the New Testament use those phrases, but they're talking about the same thing. For John, he uses the phrase born of God. And it's really uniquely his phrase. The only time it appears otherwise in Scripture is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. But the other eight times are in John's writings. So when we look at this carefully, we need to look at the Greek, and the Greek says this, theogegenete, and that means fathered by God. This means that God is creating something brand new. Think about the procreation process when someone's born into a family, right? They are born new, and this is done by God the Father. So that's what it means to be born of God. But when does it happen? And what is it specifically to be born of God? And that's what we're going to talk about. In order to understand uh, what it is, we need to go to John's earlier writing in the Gospel. The Gospel of John. So we're going to go there together. In chapter 3, Jesus is having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a teacher of God's Word. He's bright. He's brilliant. He's asking Jesus some tough questions. And when they get to the point about born of God, Nicodemus is confused. He doesn't understand it. He's clueless. And he thinks that Jesus is talking about maternal recall. Going back into mom's womb for a second time to be born. That's how silly it sounds to Nicodemus. So Jesus says this in response. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But spirit gives birth to spirit. Take a look at that second that final line there, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. So what is it to be born of God? It's spiritual rebirth by water and the Holy Spirit. Take a deep breath. It's nothing that you do. It doesn't come by your efforts. It's all done by God because spirit, just as Jesus says, gives birth to spirit. Here's a helpful analogy to better understand this. When you were born into your biological family, you didn't decide to be born. You didn't push yourself through the birth canal. Mama did that. She did all the work. 
and she brought you in to the world. And it was a very personal moment for your parents and for you. There they held you for the very first time, flesh on flesh. What a powerful moment. I remember holding Axel. I remember holding Jack. It was incredible. And you probably don't remember being born, but here you are to tell about it. That's proof that it happened. But you were a passive participant. Mom was the active participant. She did the work. And I don't remember being born too long ago, but here I have with me a copy of my birth certificate from Tahoe Forest Hospital in Lake Tahoe, near uh, uh, Lake Tahoe in Truckee, California. And it says here my parents' names. David and Betty has their signatures. It says that I was born July 8th, 1980. has the date and even the time. 2.08 p.m. That's when it all happened right there, when I entered this world. And here I have proof of it. I have a birth certificate. That was the same year, if you remember, that the miracle on ice happened when the USA team defeated the Russians. That was in February. Here I was born in July. What a special moment, right? But I was a passive participant. It just happened. I just received it. I was welcomed into the world. And so it is that when we receive this new birth, you are a passive participant because spirit gives birth to spirit. And the question then becomes, well, when does this happen? And how does it happen? Well, it certainly doesn't happen by you entering into your mother's womb a second time to be born. Here's what happens. God gives you new birth in baptism. And if you haven't paid attention so far, I really want you to pay attention from this point forward because I'm going to connect the dots with born of God in baptism. And I want you to understand it. I want you to defend it. I want you to understand it from Scripture. So I'm going to share with you several things. I invite you to write these down in the back of your bulletin. So when does it happen? Well, we've got to go back to the very beginning of the world. At the very beginning of the world in Genesis, something very interesting happened, and we can miss it if we don't take notice of it. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. God spoke, and new life was created. This is what Moses wrote. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters. So at the very beginning, Spirit hovered over waters. God spoke, and plants came into existence, animals, and eventually human life. So if you're taking notes, write this down. The Spirit hovered over the waters, then God spoke, and new life was created. And this connection between spirit and water still exists today. God still works in this way. He speaks and new life is created. And that's what happens in baptism. The spirit hovers over the waters, works through the water. God speaks his words and new life is created. The words that are spoken aren't our words. They come from Jesus' words when he said this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I remember baptizing my son, Axel. Axel Matthew Blackford, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And my brother Alex was baptized that same day. And I performed that baptism. What a special day, right? But those words come from Jesus' words himself. So take a deep breath because it's not you doing it. It's God. And he works in this mysterious way with water, his spirit, and his words to bring about new life. So when you're born of God, God washes your sins away. He gives you the Holy Spirit. He welcomes you into his family. And you have a very personal moment with God. And it's powerful. And it's something that you should remember, even if it was when you were just an infant, right? I have here with me 
my baptism certificate. I don't remember being baptized, but that's okay because it's not dependent on anything I bring to the table. It's all God's work. And this tells me that I was baptized on August 10th at Christ the King Lutheran Church in Truckee, California. And I keep this on my wall in my office because there God had a special moment with me. And I want to remember that when God gave me his grace and his mercy. So what is it? What is being born of God? Well, it's all God's work, and it's when we're baptized. So the question then becomes, are you personally born of God? And then the question is, have you been baptized? And if your answer is yes, then yes, you are born of God. If you're a new Christian and you haven't yet been baptized, then what are you waiting for? Let's make it happen. Let's get you baptized. And if you are a long-standing Christian, if you've been around in this faith a while, if you've called yourself a Christian for some time, but yet you've rejected baptism, then there's a bigger problem. Because Jesus over and over teaches and commands to be baptized. So if someone rejects baptism, they've got a bigger problem. They reject Jesus. Because Jesus teaches over and over to be baptized. Now, there's a scene in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Anyone ever seen the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? With George Clooney. It is awesome. I love that movie. And it features three criminals who have escaped from prison. And they're on their way. And they're free. And there's one of them that goes off. And he sees a preacher in the river, baptizing a huge amount of people. And he rushes out into the water. He jumps in line. He cuts in front of the others and he's baptized. And then he comes out of the waters and he speaks to the other two criminals and he says these words. Come on in. The water is fine. Here, take a look at this scene. Delmar has been saved. Well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting's my reward. Delmar, what are you talking about? We got bigger fish to fry. The preacher said all my sins is washed away, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. Well, I was lying. And the preacher said that that sin's been washed away, too. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me now. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. <sighs> <laughs> I love that scene. Come on in. The water is fine. That's my invitation to you if you haven't been baptized yet. Let's talk. We'll talk the Christian faith. Then we'll schedule the baptism. And as I said earlier, it's a personal moment that God has with you. When Jesus died for the whole world, when he was on that cross, it was a personal moment that God had with the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He died for everyone that came before you, everyone that came after you. He died for me, for you, and everybody. It was an all-world event. God had a personal moment with the world. When God baptizes you, God has a personal moment with you, with me, with you. It's a moment to cherish. Think about your parents holding you right for the first time. And here's this personal moment. When Jesus was baptized, there the Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. The Spirit was there, and the Father spoke from heaven, identifying Jesus as part of his family. This is my Son, whom I love. Right? And then Jesus was in the water. There everything happened. And from there he started a ministry going forward, his public ministry. He didn't need his sins washed away. 
But at that moment, John didn't even want to baptize him. But Jesus said, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So there Jesus received the sins of the whole world as he began something new, his ministry that would eventually take those sins up to the cross for you and for me. And he set an example for us to be baptized. And ever since, Christians have been baptized. Part of God's family, the Spirit, working with the water, God speaks a new life is created. This is amazing. It's a mystery that we receive from God. So that's what it is. And that's also the answer to if you are born of God. So the next point I want to make is that you only need one baptism. When you were born into your family, your biological parents, you only needed to be born into that family once. And when you're born into God's family, you only need to be born of God once. And whenever that happened, whatever time in your life, it took. It worked. God does good work, especially when we're baptized. And here's a scripture verse to support this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. One baptism. Now it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter your mental capacity. It's not based on your decision when you're baptized. Think about when you were born the first time. It didn't matter your mental capacity, right? You couldn't speak at that time, but there you became part of the family. So it's not based on anything that we bring to the table. Think of it this way. Does God want to baptize people who don't have the mental capacity to understand baptism or to understand Jesus or who can't physically speak and confess Jesus as Lord? Does God want to baptize those people? Yes, he does. Because it's nothing you bring to the table. It's all God. It's His grace. It's His Spirit that does the work. Spirit gives birth to Spirit, Jesus said. Not your decision gives birth to Spirit. And so, for us, we're like what Luther said. We're all beggars. And when we fully acknowledge that we got nothing for God, right? When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And while we have nothing, Christ comes to us personally and connects us to the cross and connects us to the empty grave. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 6. He said, when you've been baptized, you were baptized into his death. You were buried with him, therefore, so that you also may have a new life. So when you're baptized, you're connected to the cross, as you're buried with him, a new Adam, a new Eve, a new Matthew, a new Barb, a new Jean, a new Linda, a new Mike. You're a new person. And new people do new things. So what difference does this make in your life? Well, when you're born of God, you do new things for God. Think about it, and when you do these new things, it's going to look very different than what the world wants to do. In John's letter, 1 John, he has lots of contrasts, light and dark, truth and lies. He also has one that children of the devil and children of God. And when we do these new things, it looks very strange to the world. The world doesn't understand it. And it makes me think about my own family, the Blackford family. I'm definitely a Blackford through and through, I smile like my mom. <clears throat> I walk like my dad. And I even say the funny sayings that my dad said to me when I was a boy. Whenever I would ask a question that was an affirmative yes, my dad would say this funny saying Is a pig's butt pork? <laughs> That's what he would say. And I still remember it today. And I still say it sometimes. Whenever there was an affirmative yes, my dad would say that funny saying. Is a pig's butt pork? 
I'm also a Blackford through and through because I have Blackford taste buds. There's uniquely Blackford food that I love. And one of those dishes we enjoy is called Blackford food. Pretty creative, right? <laughs> it's macaroni cooked, then some seasoned ground beef, V8 poured on top, and a dash of garlic salt and pepper, and it is delicious. Strange to the world. I know, it sounds not very delicious, but it is. There's another Blackford food, and that is our family artichoke dipping sauce. It is so good. You pull the leaves off of the artichoke, and you dip it in the sauce. It's a mayonnaise base with red wine vinegar, a dash of garlic salt, and a dash of pepper. Can you tell garlic salt and pepper are our favorite seasonings? And it is wonderful, it's delicious. It sounds strange to have artichoke dipping sauce, but we love it. Even Amy and the kids love it. It's that good, but it's strange. It's uniquely Blackford, and I love it. I'm part of the Blackford family. And when you are part of God's family, when you're born of God, you do things that are strange and unique only to God's family. You believe in a man who died 2,000 years ago who came back from the dead, who lived halfway around the world, who floated up into heaven and now reigns over all the earth. Really? Really? And you obey him? How strange to the rest of the world. They don't understand it because they don't know God. This is what John wrote. He said, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So we receive faith from God. When we were baptized, we received the Holy Spirit, and faith isn't a gift that you give to yourself. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. So baptism is a vehicle by which God gives faith. And another strange thing that we do as people born of God is we only worship God. And this is so strange to the world that worships money and other idols. This is why John wrote in 1 John 5, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. We only worship God, and yet we can't see him. Another strange thing that we do is we pray. We pray to a God who is unseen, and we believe that he hears us. And when we sin, we repent of our sin. We say, God, I'm sorry. And we turn, and we want to go a better way. And this is why John wrote this in 1 John 5. He said, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears our prayers. He hears your prayers. Another strange thing we do is we show up here early on Sunday mornings to worship God, to be with his people, to be blessed by God and to bless him in return. And to the world, to give up a weekend morning, to do that sounds silly. That's what we do because on Sunday morning, that morning of the week, that's when our Lord Jesus conquered the grave. Amen? Amen. So that's why we want to worship him on Sunday mornings because there is when he truly gave us the gift of eternal life. When he came back from the dead without the resurrection, our faith is futile, Paul says. But to give up a weekend morning every week, that's silly to the world. Another strange thing we do is that we give. We are generous people. God teaches to give 10% of your income to the Lord. How strange to do that. Keep it all for yourself, the world says. But God teaches us to bless him, to say thanks to him, to put him first financially because he gave us his one and only son, Jesus, and this is our response to him. Yes, Lord, all I have is yours. Even the ability to earn income is all from you, Lord. So here, take the first fruits. It's yours. Another strange thing we do is that we serve. Serve people that we don't even know. Serve people that we really haven't met before. This last Thursday, our church gathered at Fox Valley Pregnancy Center in South Elgin. And there we made <clears throat> some Mother's Day toiletry bags that are going to be given to new moms that have an unplanned pregnancy. We're going to... Uh, bless these new moms as we give them packages of diapers, clean diapers. We packaged them together this last Thursday. 
It was an awesome event. Each month going forward, we're going to have these all church community outreach events to bless the world. So this is strange to the world. But you're born of God. And you do new things as people born of God. To wrap up today, God gives you new birth through water and the Spirit. Jesus said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit, Jesus said. Strong words from the Lord in response. In response to receiving his grace, in response to being born of God, we live as new people who do new things, new things for him. Amen? Amen.